Hello, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. I don't know if you're just joining us for the first time or you're rejoining us again. Um, we're going to first have a few words from Dr. Hassan, and then afterwards I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker again. Uh, I'm not going to take long, actually, but I'm going to, uh, uh, to share with you a little bit of history about the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning uh, at UAEU. Uh, and that actually was the main motive behind uh, inviting Charles to talk about uh, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning today. And he's going to be talking about it as it relates to uh, blended teaching and learning. In, uh, in fact, 2015, that, that's maybe more than three years now, uh, I invited uh, Professor Hobel from uh, University of British Columbia, who's an international figure in scholarship of teaching and learning. And uh, he gave a workshop here. And that workshop was the first talk about scholarship of teaching and learning on campus. And since then, we started recruiting 10 academic leaders uh, to enroll in a scholarship of teaching and learning course that was taught in blended format between UAEU and the University of British Columbia. Each one of us uh, worked on a scholarship of teaching uh, and learning and a scholarship of educational leadership, which is slightly different. Uh, and uh, we ended up actually having very decent uh, publications. I published a, uh, an edited chapter uh, with, with Hubble in one of the edited textbooks, and uh, the others either did the same or published an article in a decent journal out of that. And those are the scholarship of teaching and learning and scholarship of educational leadership uh, publications we have. Since then, we started inviting faculty to conduct research about how they teach. And I always say I have been teaching information systems for almost 40 years today. And in those 40 years, I have been teaching MIS just because I either uh, have a bachelor degree and I work in the, in, the, in the academia or I got a PhD in the field. And, but I have never thought of reading articles about how to teach information systems, but this scholarship of teaching and learning was an eye-opener to me, and I started publishing in how to teach uh, in our field since then. Uh, this is an invitation to you. If you are interested to conduct research about how you teach, come forward. I have a promise from the provost to fund those research uh, uh, projects as if they are disciplinary research. And at the same time, it's going to contribute to your research portfolio as well. So it's not outside the scope of your, of your disciplinary research. It's counted as well, okay, in order not to have that uh, conflict between teaching and doing research. It's actually, they should go hand in hand. Thank you very much. Okay, now I would like to say that we are very lucky to have Dr. Charles Graham back with us for the second symposium on blended teaching and learning. Um, he's a professor of instructional psychology and technology at Brigham Young University with an interest in technology-mediated teaching and learning. Charles studies the design and evaluation of online and blended learning environments and the use of technology to enhance teaching and learning. He has authored over 50 articles in over two dozen journals and 20 chapters related to online blended uh, learning in edited books. Much of his research is conducted with graduate students who he loves to work with and mentor. Charles has also co-edited two books on blended learning research. He is the co-author of a book for teachers and practitioners interested in designing blended learning environments and on book research methods for young researchers learning to do research online and blended learning contexts. So I think this will be a very valuable second afternoon session of blended learning and the scholarship of teaching and learning. So let's uh, give a Charles Graham a warm welcome, please. Thank you. Oh, you don't need this one. Yeah, I've got this one. I'm going to take my jacket off. Does that hurt? Do you guys mind if I make it a little less formal? 
I was just thinking as I was sitting here of a great technology. We know that attention is an important part of learning, right? And when people sit on the back rows, they tend to check out more quickly. So I was thinking, it, wouldn't it be awesome if we had a technology where you come into a classroom and automatically those back row chairs like flip down <laughs> until the front ones fill up and then once the front ones fill up then it lifts another row and another row. That would be a really cool technology, I think. So that would be on my wish list, I guess. Um, I, I know that uh, some of you have to go. You have teaching responsibilities and others. And many of you have mentioned that to me. So don't feel, I'm not going to be offended if you need to leave. But I would like you to be by someone while you're here because we'll be, uh, throughout the time we'll be doing some activities where I want you to interact with other people. So. Um, Last year, we uh, the keynote focused on design and uh, a course design workshop. This year, they asked me to come back and talk about the scholarship of teaching and learning. And this, uh, and we're going to have problems again here with this. So, who is familiar with that term, scholarship of teaching and learning? So, a few of you. How many? How many of you have actually done some publishing in the scholarship of teaching and learning? One, two, okay. The, um, I was just in the earlier session, I was talking with, you know, this gentleman here. Yes, and he's a professor in the chemistry. Science. Yeah, he's a chemistry faculty member. He, I think he had a teaching assignment, so wasn't able to come. But uh, he was telling me that uh, just a year or so ago, he published an article on blended learning, a uh, flipped classroom. He connected with someone, a master student, I think, from the School of Education, which was is a great way to think about the scholarship of teaching and learning, right? Connecting someone in a content discipline, connecting someone from education. And uh, it was a, a great uh, combination. They were able to get something published. I invite you two to come down. And uh, we, we have special technology that those um, chairs in the back are flipped down. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, scholarship of teaching and learning is really an important area. This is how some have defined it, has the chief goal of improving student learning, uh, which can be achieved through scholarly inquiry, reflection, and dissemination of findings. And those are going to be three important things you're going to see throughout the, uh, this presentation, that the scholarship of teaching and learning involves those things, some kind of inquiry, some kind of reflection on what you're doing, and then some way of disseminating the findings. Uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning actually goes back to the 90s and maybe even back before that. But this is where some of the, the big uh, kind of seminal works came out. Um, uh, Boyer's work in 1990. But just rethinking what we mean when we talk about scholarship and what scholarship means when we're talking about scholarship uh, around teaching and learning. And so these are some resources that I've put in the presentation. So later, if you want to go look them up, you can. There's some challenges that we face with the scholarship of teaching and learning. And that's, uh, you know, you can do the scholarship of teaching and learning in any domain. So we're going to be focusing mostly today on the scholarship of teaching and learning related to blended teaching, blended learning, right? And part of the challenge is, you're not necessarily experts in blended learning research. You're experts in you know, chemistry or 
research in chemistry or research in medical studies or nursing or you know whatever your domain is. And so but even though that's the case, we as academics really have a charge to improve our own practice and to study our own practice. And that's part of what it means to be a scholar is that we study what we do and make improvements on what we do. So I think we, it, there's a blessing and a challenge here in, in the scholarship of teaching and learning. For admi administrators who engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning, this can en enable them to um, better make data-driven decisions at the university level. For instructors and faculty, it can help them to uh, have evidence-based practices in their classroom. So not just do what they think is gonna work, but actually have some evidence to show that what they're doing is improving student, uh, student learning. So there's three big ideas that I wanna talk about, and then we'll, I'm gonna share uh, a bunch of examples and have you guys help me brainstorm questions that would be relevant to you about uh, scholarship. But these, these three ideas are um, action research, design-based research, and case study research. These are all three domains that are used, kinds of research that are used heavily in the scholarship of teaching and learning. So action research is a process where, where, where people are able to study their own practice. They look deeply at their own practice and there's a lot of reflection involved. I'll show you a process diagram in a little bit for action research. Design-based research. How many have heard of design-based research before? Okay. So I, I'll talk a little bit about design-based research um, here too that all of these slides are available if you, um, there were some of these handouts I think still going around and I'll make them, there's the link to the slides and the slides will be available right now. If you go to the link, you can't get to them because I don't want people jumping way ahead, but it's the same one from this morning, yeah. but. Uh, as soon as it's over, I'll, I'll make the slides available and then you can have the slides. So um, the last that's oftentimes used in the scholarship of teaching and learning is case study research. So we'll also talk about that. These are some of the books that I've worked on uh, with chapters that can help you um, related to this. Uh, if you're interested in doing case study research, there's a chapter in this book that I wrote on case study research, and if you email me, I'll send you the chapter, okay? Uh, so um, this is kind of an outline from that chapter. It, it, what it does is it goes through and talks about the process of doing a good case study, and it uses examples from the literature on blended learning so that you see um, you see the examples around case studies that's not around you know, uh, a social work or something else, but it's around blended teaching. Um, I think case studies are a, a good entry point, a good way to think uh, about how you get started with uh, research. If you haven't done it before, you haven't done the scholarship of teaching and learning before. Um, these are uh, a handful of books, and there's many more that have case studies around uh, blended learning. In fact, um, right now I'm working with uh, a set of faculty in Hong Kong and the area around Asia, and they're, they uh, worked with an editor, or with a publisher, to get a, a book approved, and there, it's gonna be full of Asian uh, examples of blended 
teaching and blended learning. And so that would be something that would be really cool to do here in the Middle East, right? I mean, uh, I think you have enough people, enough interest that uh, you could get uh, a publisher, Emerald or Rutledge or something else to, to agree to that. And I would be happy to help with that, Hassan, if you or someone else wanted to facilitate that. But that's a great entryway to um, get local case studies around blended learning that can also benefit the local, local community. Because oftentimes people want to read a case in their lo local context rather than a case, you know, like if you read a case of America from the United States, you learn something from it, but the context is quite different from what you experience here. So I just wanted to show you this to, sh to show that there's a lot of that out there. And this is probably just scratching the surface. These are all ones that I've been involved with, aware of in, uh, in some way. I'm sure there's lots more, though. Also, do we have anybody here from Zayed University in this room? No? Okay, so they also, uh, I was trying to find uh, if there are any regional uh, SOTL uh, journals or uh, avenues. I couldn't find any other than uh, they, they do have an SOTL conference at Zayed University that's been going for a couple years now, I think since 2015. So that might also be an outlet, right? Because dissemination is one of the goals of uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning. The ideal would be a journal publication or a book chapter or something like that. But an entry step to that would be presenting, you know, could be presenting your work at a conference. It's a great way to vet what you're doing. So this might be a possibility. I don't know anything else about this other than I was trying to find regional examples. Is anybody else aware of? I attended their activity and uh, uh, from their symposium, I knew uh, Hobol and I invited him to, to do the same here. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I know this setup, but that's Great. the only one in the Middle East, unfortunately. Uh, I wanted to show some other resources. These will be available in the slides when you go to the slides, but there are dozens and dozens of outlets, publication outlets in the scholarship of teaching and learning. They're not always as high profile as uh, you know, your tier one journals in your field, but they're very good. Many of them are very good journals and very good outlets. It's just a different community that is, that is looking at them. So this is from uh, the uh, Singapore University, the National University of Singapore. Uh, and they have on their website, they have a list of SOTL journals. So you can see the first few that they have listed there that I could get on a page. Oops. And here's, uh, Here's another page that you can see from the University of Central Florida, from uh, Vanderbilt. Um, they each have lists of journals that are interested in the scholarship of teaching and learning. So there are a lot of potential outlets for you to look at, to find which one's the best for you. Another, out, another way that you can think about this is in many of your fields, there uh, is a journal or more than one journal that is related to teaching within your field. So I did my uh, master's degree in electrical and computer engineering, and that's actually how I started to get interested. That's how I got interested in this field and ended up switching fields because I started working on a project with my faculty member um, and it was, a, it was a project related to the scholarship of teaching and learning, teaching uh, engineers how to, you know, how to learn the engineering principles. 
And that got me really excited about that. And I went to a conference that was called the Frontiers in Education, uh, Engineering Education Conference. And uh, you know, I got really excited about that. So in most of your fields, there is a journal, one or more journals and conferences that deal with uh, teaching within, within that field. So that's a great place to look to for outlets. So now I'm going to, I've talked a little bit about case studies. I've talked a little bit about outlets. Now I'm going to uh, briefly hit on design-based research and action research. So, and show you a couple of models of those. So who, can somebody give me, uh, I, there were a few hands that went up that said they thought they understood design-based research. Let's hear a couple of explanations from the crowd, from the group about design-based research. What, what are some principles involved with design-based research? I, I would share what, uh, well, a research that, I, that, that I'm still uh, conducting. Uh, and I'm not 100% sure if it fits under that umbrella or not. But uh, in our field, we have what we call technology acceptance model that is used to test the perception and attitude of people on using, on using technology. And uh, this model has been validated in the literature for so many years now. So I took that model and I tried to validate it on students accepting different uh, types of, 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 of learning. One of them is online learning and, and, and having websites at that time and all that. And I validated that model based on that and I tested the critical success factors that can contribute to the acceptance and adoption of different educational technologies in there. And I started building on that to the extent that I came up with my own model of accepting hybrid learning, as I called it in that article, uh, from as perceived by students and as perceived by instructors as well. Great. Okay. Other? One of the projects that I've been working on for design-based research was just on co-creating co a tool. So the process of researching the design of a learning analytics tool with different stakeholders. Great. So it's researching the actual design process rather than the Great. results. Of the product. Yeah, I think both of those would fit under design-based research. I, I would say that the, the key idea behind design-based research is that um, you're building something and you're going through multiple iterations. And usually the thing you're building is complex enough that, you know, in, you know, traditional scientific research, you have, uh, you know, you, you have your, you know, you have your control group and you have your group that you're doing your intervention with, right? But in lots of design-based research, the, the design and the context are so complicated that you really can't control all of the factors. And so this is what design-based research is about. It looks like, I have a picture of a, a, a model of design-based research. It looks exactly like what we do in our classes, in fact, where we have a design. Think about this as being your class. Right? You've designed your blended class, and there's some core attributes that you think are important to be looking at. And there's an outcome that you care about. Maybe it's grades, maybe it's persistence, maybe it, it could be whatever you think that the outcome is that you want to look at, or multiple outcomes. And so you build this class, this course, this blended course, describing these core attributes that it has, measure the outcome, and that is your first iteration, right? Then you learn from that design experience what 
needs to be changed, you change that. So I've marked that with this little uh, you know, prime. So maybe core attribute three stays the same, but you make some changes to core attribute one and core attribute two. You describe those changes. You implement again, measure the outcome. And so what you're doing is you're show in the research, you're showing this evolution of the design and the outcomes that happen as, as, it, you know, as the design evolves. And really, this design process maybe is too messy or too, th there, there are too many confounding variables to be able to do a really you know, clean experimental design or something like that with it. And so this, this uh, design-based research process is being accepted more and more, especially in educational research where we recognize that you really can't control there's almost nothing you can control, really, right? I mean, even students have agency, right? You can't force them to, to, to do certain things. So, so uh, this is a, a really interesting model, uh, design-based research that fits well into the scholarship of teaching and learning. Action, action research, the process for action research looks kind of like this. You begin with a problem that you care about. And I think that's really important with action research because action research is you focus on the local problem, the, the, the problem that you care about in your course or in your, your institution, uh, institutional context. You study about that problem, plan, make a plan, and then you take some kind of action, which means you know, maybe that's your course design or your, uh, your professional development or whatever it is that would be addressing this problem that you care about. You collect data and analyze and you reflect and then you disseminate or share the findings after each cycle. So that's another thing. This is kind of like the design-based research process too. <coughs> uh, similar in that it's iterative you're trying to you're trying to build um, on your your research continues to build as you go through iterations of testing and trying new things, and it's that articulating the reflection and articulating the process that you went through that's the valuable contribution to knowledge. Any questions about kind of these different models? Yeah. I mean, people are doing randomized controlled trials in educational research. Yeah, absolutely. So what, um, I mean Pe uh, yeah, people are doing randomized controlled trials. The challenge, there are a lot of challenges with it, though. And especially, there, there are a lot of ethical issues with it, too, right? Because the ethical issues center around if you have an intervention that you think is valuable, then withholding that intervention from some students is not ethical. If you have an intervention that you think is um, risky, then it's not ethical to uh, require students to do it. So there are a lot of issues around that, although even though randomized control trials, the, you know, kind of the, the gold star kind of thing, this is a different paradigm. I'm going to show you some. I'm going to show you uh, <coughs> some types of research. You know, we also have quasi-experimental research. I mean, th there's a lot of different types of research that you can do. I'm presenting these as alternative models to to those. Okay, that are possibilities. Um, so at this point, what I want you to do, we're going to, I want you to, we're going to take about five minutes. I want you to think about your own context and write down 
one or two problems or challenges related to your own teaching, blended teaching context, that are of interest to you, that you care about. And I'll give you one example. I was talking with Hassan yesterday. Sorry, Hassan, I'm using you as a lot of, uh, for a lot of these examples. But uh, we were talking about um, how students in many of the blended classes lack some self-regulation. They haven't learned how to be a good blended learning student. And so that is an example of a problem that the institution is facing, maybe a problem that the CTL, CTL or a particular instructor would be facing. So that's the kind of thing that I want you to think about. Think of a problem, something that's a barrier to, to your students learning or to you being able to do what you want to do in your blended class, okay? Go ahead, you got three or four minutes. I want you to write down two problems, okay? And then I'm gonna randomly call on some of you to share yours with the group. Okay, I'd like you to turn to someone that you're sitting close by and share. If you're not sitting by someone, you need to come down by someone and share. This is a active learning workshop. So no, no non-participants. Non so Hassan, that means you're going to have to move over here. And some of you who are not by anybody are going to need to come down and connect with someone. In the back row, could you come down and join with someone and share? Are you participating? Or you could move over there with those ladies. So he'll share with you guys? Okay. Hmm. You guys already have a chance to share? You're very efficient.
may take about one more minute. If you haven't had a chance to share, uh, let the person who hasn't shared yet share. If, if your partner or a person was sharing with you had a really interesting problem, I want you to rat them out and share the idea or point to them and we'll have them share the idea. Okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, both of us are from College of Medicine and uh, one of our problems in our blended course is students copying from each other and pasting the same answer. So academic honesty is uh, one of the challenges. Okay, great. Yes, let's get, we have, we have a couple microphones ready. So my teaching is uh, faculty development, so my uh, students are the faculty. What I feel the problem that I faced is uh, there is a gap between what is taught even if the students are motivated, the material is engaging and all of that. And uh, because I'm from medicine, so uh, the, the transfer of skills from the coursework or from the academics to the workplace is a real challenge because you can't really uh, control the variables in the workplace. So uh, I think uh, we want an optimal transfer, but it doesn't really happen. So that's an area that's uh, kind of concerned. So that area of uh, learning transfer is uh, something that a lot of people have studied, right? So it would be a really ripe place to look. What are some other questions? Anybody, any of the ladies in the back have questions you'd like to share? Okay. Sometimes feeling difficulties to measure the outcome of the student, uh, uh, how much he learns. Uh, another one uh, or another problem is too much giving is also too much uh, or soon we can be going from the student mind. So how we can resolve these problems? Mm. Great, yeah. Outcomes are tough, figuring out how to do outcomes. The sessions tomorrow I think are going to talk about assessment. Uh, so that'll be good. Yeah, Up back there and then here. Okay, you, you can give her the microphone. Okay, go ahead. So uh, I'm from College of IT and my friend is from College of Math. And we were wondering, all, are all subjects uh, capable of being blended? Or for example, topic like programming is hard to be blended? Okay, so that's a great question to be thinking about, right? Are there some content domains or types of learning that are easier for you know, to do with blends, with, with blending, or certain kinds of blending. Great. Yeah. Uh, building trust, um, getting stakeholders to trust the outcomes of um, our pro programs since they're all blended. Uh, another question is keeping the instructors and the students motivated. Mm. How and when yeah. and why? Motivation is a big issue. I mean, motivation is a big issue to study even in just a traditional classroom, right? I think there was an interesting study that was done. I think, I can't remember if it was Harvard. I think it was Harvard. They actually put cameras in to watch which students and how many students came into their large enrollment classes and then tracked their performance on grades, you know, on tests and that kind of thing. And it was astounding. It was like, I can't remember the exact numbers. That it was like 30% or something of the students were actually attending class. A very, very low number. Podcasting. 
<laughs> so, can you say that again <laughs> so people can hear? When I went to Harvard in 2006, um, I was at uh, Dostason Center. They told me, they showed me their big lecture theater and they said that the attendance had dropped to 6% and they'd started podcasting because uh, they found it useless to <laughs> waste the time. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's interesting. Uh, when we were talking about it, we came up with study learning skills and creating a sense of independency among the mm. students. How to go about doing that? How do you facilitate it so that that can be created? Great. These are some great uh, questions, problems to. Um, yeah, um, I think some of my students lack basic technical skills. Um, how do you build basic technical skills so they can actually get on the, on the laptop and work? Yeah, it's great. We talked about this morning, we talked about the foundation for blended teaching competencies, right? Or the dispositions and technical skills, it's going to be the same for students, right? If they're going to be good blended learners, they're going to have to have some baseline uh, technical skills. So, good. Um, a pitch shift away from what people are saying. Uh, it looks like everything is at the higher education. I'm from the Ministry of Education, Dubai, um, Mathematics Education Specialist Center, giving support to teachers. The main problem is students struggle with vocabulary in English, mm. in math, studying math and English the first time. So thinking how blended learning can help me and my teachers. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, interesting question. I've heard people ask questions similar to that with second language learners, right? That uh, sometimes being able to see and read in a discussion board allows them greater access to the learning because when they're in class, uh, the words go by too fast or, you know, so um, interesting question. So this is the starting point, you know, having a problem that you care deeply about. Now, now some of those problems are not going to be solvable in one Iteration, right? You're not gonna you're not gonna solve the problem of self-regulation in one try. But having a question that you care deeply about allows you to start this iterative process that's that's part of the scholarship of teaching and learning, and hammer away at it. That's what we as scholars do. Rarely, I mean, it's it's kind of it, it's a falsehood, I think. I believe, and all the research experience that I've had to that, that, that you do an experiment and you discover this truth and that's kind of th the end of it, right? I mean, every study is building on something else and even an experimental study, it kind of has this veneer of impeccability but when you start digging down deeper, you realize that there are a lot of things, at least the, the, the ones that I've done, you start finding out, oh, there, uh, there's challenges with this. There's contextual issues that I did, wasn't aware of that are, could be conf potentially confounding variables. And so it, 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 there, what we're talking about here is starting with a deep a problem that you care deeply about and then starting to think about how you're going to iterate against that and build knowledge on how to solve that problem. Here are a couple of the problems that I wrote down for myself. <clears throat> how do I measure student engagement when they're online? So I was thinking about this problem of when a student is in class, like when you're, in, when you're here, I have some intuition about who's engaging with me in the lecture and who's not. And whether that intuition is accurate or not, I mean, that's an empirical question that could be answered, right? But I can see, I can see when people start to disengage. I can see when someone's um, searching on their iPad, you know, 
playing games or doing whatever, you know, I can, I can, I can see that level of engagement. And if I see, for example, that Hassan is starting to fall asleep, I, I notice that in the class, and I can do things, I can, I can create an intervention that tries to counter that. Like I might come up and say, Hassan, what's the, you know, how do you, th what do you think about this question I just asked? And Hassan would, and he would be thinking for a second and be like, what question, what question, what question? <laughs> And then he hopefully won't fall asleep again, you know? But when, when people are online, now I have no clue what they're doing, right? It's really hard to know. And so this is one of my questions. How do I measure students' engagement when they're online? And then, oh my, I don't know what happened with that. Let's see. Okay, so my second question was, what practices help increase student self-regulation? So I, you know, I'm also very interested in having students learn to be learners, right? Because my sense is that if the students always need a teacher by them, a teacher to uh, kind of drive everything that they do, their learning is going to be limited. And so I care about lifelong learning. And I feel like that's part of what our job at a university is to do, to help people become lifelong learners. And so what are the practices that help increase? You know, so that's a, that's a question that I have. My third question is, what did I do when I converted from PowerPoint to? <laughs> um, I hope this is not uh, going to be a problem. Uh, Now we have this. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, uh, I'm going to kind of go through these next three areas. This is kind of an outline of what I want to talk about next. I want to talk about some types of inquiry. This will get a little bit at the experimental um, research idea. Uh, I want to talk about some I research ideas and trends that I think are important. And then I'll have you also engage in this part uh, uh, to deepen what we've talked about. And then I'm also gonna talk about some pitfalls that we want to avoid. So types of inquiry. This is how I think about the world in terms of inquiry. This comes from uh, the, the basic explore, explain design comes from a, a scholar called Gibbons. And it's, it's interesting to think about the different kinds of research that you can engage in. There's a debate, in my field at least, that pits the scientific against the technological. Uh, and by technological, it doesn't mean devices and that kind of thing, but that, uh, inquiry that comes out of uh, a, a technological approach is different from inquiry that comes out of a scientific approach. And uh, Herbert Simon uh, wrote a book called, um, am I blanking on it, uh, The Science of the Artificial, that talks about uh, domains like education 
where you're dealing with human beings, and so it's a very different uh, environment from when you're dealing with atoms, like in a physics lab or chemicals in a chemistry lab, because humans have agency. And so, anyway, these three areas of research I think are important to understand. The, f uh, the first is explore research. And the purposes of explore research are really to ask things like, what exists? Uh, it tries to define and categorize. A lot of the early scientific research was explore research. You know, they were uh, taxonomizing the insects or the different species or the different kinds of rocks, minerals. Uh, that all falls under explore research. Then we have explain, which is trying to ask, you know, why does this happen? Looks for causality, correlation. This is what we typically think about when we think about research, is this explain research. Then we have design research, which I've already talked to you a little bit about. And this is a, this is a different kind uh, with a different purpose. It's really, its purpose is how do I achieve this outcome? How do I achieve this thing that I want to do? It's also a way of uh, um, creating new knowledge. In fact, I'm going to share an example with you, a, a non uh, educational example and non-educational example, but I want to throw out one other thing here. Like, even in medicine, a lot of early medicines came about through design or technological research, not scientific research. Because people saw that something was happening. They didn't know why it was happening, but they... Um, yeah. And later, they might have discovered, you know, why when people eat this leaf, it, you know, makes them feel better. But go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to back to defer. Um, <laughs> you know, the, uh, because I teach history of medicine. Okay. And it's been a big tragedy because people have been giving herbs that don't work for centuries. And until we started doing randomized controlled trials, uh, we were, you know, really harming our patients. So, I mean, uh, if blended teaching and learning were a drug, it would not be approved <laughs> until you know, had the randomized yeah. controlled trial. Uh, uh, so, um, thank you for, uh, you know, for raising that issue. I mean, technological research, there's a lot of experimentation. I mean, there's a lot of trial and error that happens in technological research. And so, uh, because oftentimes they don't have the tools to be able to do the same kind of experiment that you would do in a randomized control trial. Let me show a, another example outside of medicine, okay? In science, they're trying to understand how and why things happen. In technology, they're trying to discover how to influence, make things happen. So that, that's kind of the distinction that Gibbons makes. So um, I'm going to go down through and show an example. I'm going to show this example related to flight uh, and also uh, uh, related to blended learning. So I'm going to show a blended learning example and an example around flight. So explore research is trying to define and categorize knowledge. So these are some visual representations of how that might be. You know, you're, you're say these distinguishing attributes are part of this, or you might um, create a taxonomy that um, says these are kinds of, you know, this other thing. So this happened in early days in science. Uh, the purpose is to describe and organize Descriptive case studies, phenomenology, ethnographies, those are uh, oops. 
So here's an example with flight, right? Uh, and maybe this also builds into what you were talking about, you know, early people trying to figure out how to fly <laughs> um, looked at birds uh, and described very carefully the, you know, the wingspans, what the feathers looked like, all of those kinds of, of course our planes don't look anything like birds, right? But this was part of the uh, explorer is trying to describe very carefully what was happening with flight and why they thought birds were able to fly. Um, an example here is also that the Wright brothers, for example, looked at what was happening with birds' wings and they used, uh, they, they tried to kind of model that in their uh, early versions of, uh, of the planes uh, doing wing warping. So they actually had cables that would make the wings try and bend and warp like the, like the observations of the bird's wings. In blended learning, In blended learning, uh, this is a good example of obser observe, uh, observe research, descriptive research. Horn and Staker went in, they looked at like 80 different classrooms that were doing blended learning, and they started to develop some descriptive models that these would, these different, uh, uh, that were described the different kinds of blends that they saw. And so mostly these models uh, describe the physical environment, not the pedagogical things that are happening, but they have things like rotation models and they have a series of rotation models, have a flex model, self-blend model, enriched virtual model, and each of those models are descriptions of what they saw the patterns that they started to put together from the class observations that they saw. So explain research is the one that we think about most. Basically, this is a simple, simplified visual representation where um, uh, we have one variable that's influencing another variable trying to explain the relationship between those. And this is where we see the co our correlational research and our experimental research. A flight example is uh, Bernoulli's principle, right? So they're trying to describe what caused a, a plane to lift. And they developed this uh, scientific principle, the Bernoulli's principle, to explain what was happening with the air pressure around the wings that actually created the lift. An example of explain research that we've seen happen in blended learning is there's a theory in blended learning called uh, community of inquiry, and it you may have heard of this theory before, but it has three components, cognitive presence, social presence, and teaching presence. And the basic uh, idea behind it is that these three uh, elements together are positively correlated with student performance. And so that's a, a theory that can be can be tested. So here's a simplified visual representation of uh, design research. There's a context that has uh, multiple elements in it. 
and that uh, that design leads to the outcome. So uh, here's another way converting these variables to the core attributes. Now the interesting thing about design research is that when you have when you have a classroom, uh, it's really difficult to account for all of the possible confounding variables. And so with design research, really what you're doing is you're identifying, it's, it's descriptive in a way, because you're identifying the core attributes, you're identifying the outcomes, and you're making some claims about that uh, as you iterate across design. And so probably uh, evolution-wise, um, the explain research, I mean, if you look at, I put design research at the bottom of the stack, but if you look at the examples of the plane, oh, I guess I should show a sample of the plane here. Uh, let me finish this. So the purpose is structuring artifacts interventions to increase the likelihood of desired outcomes. Uh, I have to stand a little closer. Uh, this happened a lot with the development of, of flight. So uh, there was uh, multiple iterations that went you know, from gliders ultimately to planes. There was uh, experimenting with things like building an aluminum engine, trying it out, uh, taking a propeller from a, a ship and using that design for the plane. So there were, it, it was, some people would call this tinkering it was systematized tinkering, right? But uh, they were creating their designs and they, they even built something like a wind tunnel. They, uh, not something like a wind tunnel, they even built a wind tunnel, the first wind tunnels, to try and test their wing shape design, right? So they would change the design of the wing, they'd stick it in there, see what it did, change the, the design a little bit more, stick it in the wind tunnel to see what it did, and, and that's how they went. So this, this came actually before we see the explain kinds of designs, like th with Bernoulli's principle. So maybe what we're, you know, maybe the evolution really is you start out with uh, explore designs that are looking and describing the world around them. Then you see more uh, design-based research where people are ex you know, trying to build things. And then ultimately when we have the right tools and the ability, we move to the, uh, the explain, you know, the gold, the gold standard. So, uh, an example in blended learning of this is the practical inquiry model. And so in the practical inquiry model, they have four core attributes that they talk about. Uh, this is part of the, the community of inquiry. Uh, and so these things are explore, exploration, integration, having a trigger, trigger event and resolution. And these are supposed to influence the student's problem solving abilities. So in any inquiry, there's probably lots of other things going on besides those four things. But those are the four core attributes that they're playing around with in that model. Stand closer. So here is uh, physical representation of the practical inquiry model. And this is just to show that the 
relationships between core attributes can also be important as, it, as demonstrated here. So in design-based research, there's a couple of different ways that things that can happen, that uh, iterations can happen. You can have iterations that are happening side by side, design A and design B. The most common though is that you have designs changing in time, like this. You have an iteration, you change it a little bit, you change it a little bit more, and you, you continue to look at those outcomes. So uh, with blended learning, uh, an important aspect of this, if you're going to do design-based research, is that when you look at core attributes, that you don't just look at the physical attributes. So this is a common problem that we see, like, pretty ubiquitously with blended learning. And that is that people um, talk about blended learning in terms of online and face-to-face, -face, but they don't talk about the pedagogical layer. So like what's actually happening pedagogically in the online space and what's happening pedagogically in the face-to-face -face space. And so this, is cu this has created a lot, of, a lot of confusion, I think, in the research because people say, you know, it was the blend that made this happen and Really, we don't know anything about the blend other than there was a th there was an online component and a face-to-face -face component because they don't describe well the core attributes of the pedagogical component. So let me just ask uh, you to think about this. What uh, of these kinds of research um, explore, explain design, which type of inquiry do you see yourself being most interested in doing? Uh, go ahead and share with your neighbor about that. And you have a, you, you have a new neighbor now. Okay. <laughs> you know, while we're, we're, we're discussing that, um, th this happened to me and, and, and maybe it's a dimension that we might address in here. In, in most of my disciplinary research, I have been a quantitative researcher. When I started getting into the scholarship of teaching and learning, I found that it's mostly qualitative and I had to go on a steep learning curve to learn the, qual the qualitative research methodologies, which is completely different from and, and, and I spent some time just learning how to do qualitative research before getting into uh, what I'm doing. Uh, well, now it's, at, I, I feel like, well, it's, it's pretty nice, uh, not switch and, and, and adding still to my research skills, but w w what is it? W w why it's mostly qualitative when it comes to subtle and, and, and scholarship, even of educational leadership? Yeah, uh, I mean that's a that's a really good question. I think uh, I think part of it is where we're at in in terms of educational research, the difficulty with which we have to study our own practice. So it's really really difficult, for example, to um, to do a true experiment because you you can't randomly assign students very often. Students are self-selecting. Um, you can still do quasi-experimental design, but then oftentimes you have the challenge of, um, you oftentimes have the challenge of numbers, right? Uh, if you have sections of classes that are, you know, 20 students, size uh, and you have a lot of other variables or you know different instructors for different sections different contextual issues you can't control why 
you know, maybe all of the students who are better students are taking the morning class because they have another, you know, there's just a lot of variables that make it difficult to, to really do solid research that way in your own context. It's not impossible, people still do it, but it's, it's challenging. I think also in education, it depends on the topic that you're researching. So it might start from explore, but then uh, once you start exploring, then you want to, whatever observation you've made, you want to explain those, then you move into the next phase. And then once you have those you know, explanations, then you try to fit them to some patterns. To, so you go back to theory and to the principles and models and all, so you move into the research paradigm. Mm -hmm. So it's all kind of interlinked and depends where you are in your research with that topic and where the world is. Yeah. So I, I think. And it also depends on the kinds of claims you want to be able to make, right? With a, with a design research or with uh, explore research, you're not going to be able to make the same kind of claims that you make with uh, explain research, you know, with like an experimental study, right? But oftentimes the purpose is not that in the scholarship of teaching and learning. Oftentimes the purpose is you're trying to share best practices with someone else, or you're trying to share what worked yeah. in your context with, with someone else. And even when you're in the explain kind of uh, paradigm, uh, sometimes, yes, you get certain results. But then you, uh, and it's quantitative mainly, but you still don't know the reason why. And then you have to really go deep and you then take the help of qualitative. Yeah. And then you have a mixed method kind of model because you weren't able to explain all of what you found. Yeah. So. Yeah, very good. Other thoughts? Okay, so take just a couple of minutes and uh, share with your neighbor where you see yourself in this, where you see yourself maybe starting, maybe ending. I don't know, but like wh wh what kind of research do you see yourself doing? people fast. Okay, so um, where, uh, let, let's just hear from a couple of people. Do either of you want to share where, where you're seeing yourselves at? I would just say I'm, because I'm working on design-based re research, that that's just where my, I, I find it to be more, cha it's challenging. It's not that the other two are also challenging, yeah. but for some reason, with the design, it's it's been it's been difficult. I don't I, I, to to organize your information to really figure out where you're going. But mm -hmm. I've I've enjoyed that it's very pragmatic, um, and that I'm really solving a particular Concrete problem, problem. And, mm -hmm. and and that feels a bit more solid to me than some of the other work that I've done because it can be challenging to find cause and effect, in yeah. as we just talked about in education research. It can be you might not know exactly what within your design is the secret sauce or the, but you know that this design is working. Yeah, yeah. You know, I look at it differently though, because, and, I, and I'm not thinking about my disciplinary research. I'm, I'm thinking about it from the scholarship of teaching and learning, and I look at myself at this stage of blended teaching and learning in which I'm just piloting my first blended course. Mm -hmm. And I do not really have a solid theory about how successful blended teaching and learning in our part of the world and, and, and given this organizational culture. So I'm definitely on the exploratory uh, mode. 
until we get into a, a mature level of blended teaching and learning, and then we're gonna start uh, explaining, we might start you know, coming up with our version of blended teaching and learning theory, if, if that might be the case. And, and, uh, and I'm saying this because uh, sometimes I have a well-tested model that I'm validating it in my setup, and sometimes I do not have a tested model, and I'm just exploring what could work in my case. coming to me and he's, he's talking to me about active learning and he's like, I've discovered this thing, it's active learning, it's amazing and no one's ever done it before. And I'm like, <laughs> so it, it's like, he's so excited and so, and he's just yeah. thrilled to be part doing the scholarship of teaching and learning, you know, but in his discipline, but there is that learning curve, I think, where it's like, oh, now you have to understand what's, what exists in education what's as well as how that blends into your discipline, yeah. exactly. So it just reminded me. Well, I think it also depends on the level of dissemination that you want to do. Right? There's multiple, with the scholarship of teaching and learning, there's multiple levels of dissemination. One level of dissemination can be sharing with colleagues, right? In a local, and in that case, it, you, you don't necessarily have to have, you know, know what all other researchers have done, but in order to move it towards a, you know, a, a peer reviewed publication, I think um, what I'd like to do is also start off with exploring because I think through discussions and everything we realize what the challenges are here in the UAE specifically. And now, like Hassan was saying, blended learning is now being implemented in the institution. And I think there's enough teachers doing it now to go back and explore how the teachers are actually facing these challenges. Not what they are, but what are they, how are they managing it? What are they doing? And then once you gain that, you know, with the questionnaires or interviews, how, however you want to go about doing the research, then you can find out the different ways and then maybe at the end of it, put in some kind of design or maybe not a specific design, but suggestions or ideas. Great. Oh. Yeah. Is it possible to integrate two of these um, methods? like exploring and explaining together in one, trying to answer the oh. questions of exploring no. and explaining? I mean, I suppose you could have two different questions. We don't, t we don't tend to see that because usually there's certain methods that go with those different uh, kind of types of research. So the, the kinds of uh, methods that would go with an explore to be observational, uh, you, you might see overlap between explore and Explain. design uh, because both involve a lot of description, observation. Uh, I don't know. May, I hadn't thought about that before. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I think it must be able to. Any research projects which have parts? So the first part is about exploring and the second part deals with more of explaining and maybe right. the third part so it, it can a happen. A large research yeah, project. Yeah, a yeah. large or a longitudinal one. Yeah. So um, I'm going to show you some, uh, oh let me pass these out. So uh, this is uh, Explore Research. <laughs> um, it looked at uh, 205 English language dissertations on blended learning and did a thematic analysis of the methodologies and the research questions that were asked. Um, you can see that the majority of the research that was being done was being done in 
the higher ed context. You can see that, uh, for the dissertations at least, that the majority were using some kind of inferential statistics or uh, inferential statistics combined with qualitative. Uh, so you can kind of see the, the general methods, uh, the breakdown of the methods that were used. Um, then the thematic analysis, what the thematic analysis did is it went in and looked, pulled out the research questions from all of those dissertations and then did, uh, coded those research questions uh, by theme. And so you can see some of the themes that emerged from that. 51% uh, of the uh, research questions ha had something to do with learner outcomes. Uh, we had 38% that d dealt with dispositions, instructional design, and so on. One of the things I wanted you to note down at the bottom is that there's a ver quite a small number that deal with professional development. So this is an area that is kind of a ripe area for uh, studying, and you're in a good position here to, to look at that uh, issue. Each of those major themes was broken down into uh, sub-themes. So for example, uh, this area of learner outcomes, you see that there were the majority of the ones that focused on learner outcomes were on performance outcomes. Um, uh, the next highest was student satisfaction as an outcome, engagement as an outcome, uh, learning effectiveness as an outcome, and so on. Over here, related to dispositions, there was, you can kind of see that a lot of the studies focused on perceptions of students, faculty, and then a f one study uh, was at the institutional level. Attitudes looked at students and faculty. I, I also wanted you to see that this was pretty low number, so that's also an area where, these are dissertations, so I'll show you some, I'll show you research studies later, but, uh, Step a little closer. This uh, other study that was handed out to you, so that one looked at dissertations. Not all dissertations were actually published beyond the dissertation. This one looked at the 50 top cited articles uh, in blended learning. It looked at what journals they were published in. It looked at uh, the 25 top cited book chapters, the 10 top cited books, the top cited authors, then the research context, methodologies, and then an analysis of the research questions. So the reason this can be helpful to you is it can show you kind of where there's less research. That might be a place where uh, there's a, a gap. We need more. Uh, and it'll also show you uh, where some of these articles are being published. So here is uh, the context. You can see once again that the main context for these blended studies is in higher ed, the vast majority. <coughs> Oops. These show uh, these bubble charts show authors, the top cited authors and top, top cited books. <coughs> this was six years ago, so I'm sure this has changed some. Uh, this shows journals where these top uh, articles were published. So this is also a way to, a place to look in terms of possible uh, publication. Both of those articles that you saw were published in the internet and higher education. Of course, they wouldn't have been included in this number. 
This is a breakdown of the uh, methods that were used in the studies. So, uh, you know, these gold star ones over here were the ones that uh, um, we labeled them as gold star if they had a theory that they were um, trying to validate or work with. And uh, so a lot of them did not, as you can see, which is kind of interesting. It's also an indication that this is a very um, juvenile uh, field of study. Which may also explain the, you know, you know, why it's different from, you know, the studies in medicine, for example. Here, once again, uh, categories, uh, the, the thematic analysis of the research questions. Once again, I think professional development's an area that's kind of ripe for research because there's not as much there, at least in those top 50 articles, cited articles. Oops. <coughs> and then here's some of the, so, uh, once again, here's where uh, student engagement shows up under learner outcomes. And then this one is the primary topic of interaction. So you can see uh, student to student interaction, general collaboration, community, student to instructor, social presence. I wanted to show you some data uh, from research about uh, international authors and journals, journals, or not journals, but publications about blended learning that are coming from different worldwide regions. I thought this would be interesting to you. So here are the seven worldwide regions that we uh, coded for. And we coded something as being in the region if uh, at least one of the authors was from the region. I think we might have also, we might have also included it if uh, if the study took place in the region, even if one of the authors isn't from the region. So this will be uh, interesting for you to see. Um, these are the top two per region. So you can kind of see uh, the orange here is the Middle East. So kind of uh, right in the 2008, 2009, the top cited ones. What I, well, I think what we found from the Middle East was that the vast majority of publications were coming from <coughs> Turkey. And outside of Turkey, there was very little. So, uh, oops. Yeah, so, oh, there was, uh, we took 10, the top 10 from each region and so eight of the top 10 were from Turkey. There was one from Israel and one from Bahrain. Bahrain. So UAE, room for growth, right? You guys can overwhelm them in this next year or two. Uh, oh, there was one from Egypt too, but it was, we put it in Africa, of course, here. But, uh, so you can kind of see, then we did a social, we, Part of what we were trying to find out is with this was where are the conversations happening and how are the conversations uh, you know, in other parts of the world from where we were in the United States or North America, are the conversations around blended different? Are they happening differently? Uh, these are all English speaking journals too, so that's a limitation. Uh, so we didn't, you know, there might be conversations that are happening in non-English journals that we were not aware of. 
And so this uh, social network al analysis looked at uh, within those, that group of top cited articles, the directionality in the, so in the network analysis shows who was citing whom. So you see that uh, right now, the vast majority were, you know, are citing um, these ones in North America, are th although there's some that are, uh, I think, uh, I can't remember where, I mean, that's Europe, but I don't remember what particular article that was. So there's some directionality going that way and some directionality coming down here to Oceania too. So I show this to you because I think that there's some great room for growth here, right? Total citations of top articles. <coughs> so took 10 articles from each region, right? And then these are the uh, number of citations for each of those. So you see uh, where the Middle East is right there for their top 10. Yeah. Here are uh, the different journals that they were published in. So if you want to look the orange, so there was, you know, one published in British Journal of Educational Technology, three in a uh, two in these, uh, these other two, and then one uh, down here. So um, now I want to talk about some promising research directions, kind of explore this a little bit further. Uh, really what we're trying to do in the, the um, in SOTL is we want to solve interesting local challenges and also try and think about how that can contribute to a more generalizable knowledge base. And so I think that this is a really good framework to use to start thinking about. This is the Sloan Consortium, which is now the Online Learning Consortium. They came up with this, uh, these five pillars of learning quality. And there's quite a bit of research around these, because uh, uh, they did you know, a decade or more of research around these different pillars. There's, I think that this uh, book, The Elements of quality is uh, available freely online if you want to look at it. But these are the pillars. Access, learning effectiveness, cost effectiveness, student satisfaction, and faculty satisfaction. And uh, cost effectiveness, sometimes they label as scale. Like how do you, how do you move uh, something to scale in a cost effective way? So that's usually an institutional, more of an institutional issue. Okay. Let's get the microphone. Because um, organizational culture is is an important uh, factor in here, uh, and the top management support. So nothing related to the institution uh, itself. Yeah. In here. So this. this I think this mostly stemmed from a, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really, this, this isn't all encompassing for sure. Uh, most of the organizational questions that get asked were in this, and that's why they, you know, they changed it to, they changed it to scale, okay. not cost effective. L let me give an example because this might affect how publishable our work will be. Okay. Uh, in, in this country, if you have a 100% online course, it is not going to be recognized by the Ministry of Education. It has to have at least 25% face-to-face in order to be accredited by the Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware that this restriction is anywhere, that 100% online online program or course is not going to be recognized. 
So when you publish based on that, you say, well, what, what, what is the significance of this? What's the contribution? You know, you're, you're just a little too rigid. understand the 25%, but how does that relate to this? Oh, I see what a, you're saying. A factor that, well, if uh, one of my research questions here, I would like to work on the critical success factors, but if I flip that coin, what about the critical failure factors? What are the, 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 the hurdles of getting into 100% online, even though this institution is promoting 100% online programs, but the struggle is going to be with uh, with the accreditation body in the Ministry of Education. Y you know, it, the main point is the, the organizational culture should be an impactor here, but since most of this is coming from, correct me if I'm wrong, research published in uh, Northern American journals, and, and none of these is published in local uh, yeah, Asian or, or, or African journals because of obvious reasons. So that's why these factors are yeah. not. That's a really, uh, and I don't think that this is a, I mean, it obviously doesn't cover the whole spectrum. Like some of the research that I've done, right, is on institutional adoption of blended learning. Where does that fit in here? But I think that this is a this is a good place to start thinking about some of the key categories that people are are thinking about. That you know, you're right. You're right that there are categories that don't exist under these pillars. Other questions or issues? this so <clears throat> trying to think about where to go with our last 15 minutes you guys don't have this problem when you teach do you <laughs> you profess you speak too much or profess too much um, let me share uh, let me share a couple of studies and I'll share kind of my uh, path. I was going to do an activity, but I think it prob it probably it, this will probably be more valuable to you given the amount of time that's left. So there's been some research on effectiveness. This is an example of that uh, Barbara Means study, which is pr quite popular. Uh, here's another Bernard study. These are meta-analyses that look at experimental, quasi-experimental research that's been done. Uh, it's part of the reason why I have a little bit of a jaded, I'm sorry that, uh, what was his name? That had to leave? Yeah. Uh, I have a little bit of a jaded uh, uh, feeling about some of the experimental research that's been done in the field, and it's probably because in education we don't control the variables as tightly as they do in the medical research or as they're required to do in the medical research. But these studies, meta-analyses, look at the, the uh, blended learning and found overall blended learning has about a third of a standard deviation on outcomes, improvement on outcomes, effect size improvement over the other, either completely face-to-face -face or fully online. The problem is, maybe I'll jump ahead and show, uh, let me show. I want to show why. Oh, here. So here you go. Um, this shows. Oh, some of the. This shows. Uh, Chuck Zubin 
who's at the University of Central Florida, went through all of the studies in the Barbara Means study. And you know, it said that each of them was a blended intervention. But when he went and looked at the pedagogies, this was the range of pedagogies that were in those studies. So even though they were all blended, they were all using very different pedagogies. So it makes it difficult, it, even though you have a meta-analysis that says blended learning was better, it was the thing that was similar about them was that they had online and face-to-face -face components. But the most important thing about them, which is the pedagogy, that there wasn't anything common about them. And so it makes it, it, makes it really hard to, uh, take meaning, you know, something meaningful away from that. Um, let me, I want to, I want to make sure that I talk about some of the pitfalls really quick, really quickly before we end, because I think these are important to avoid. Um, Pitfall number one is that we don't, we underspecify the blended learning models that we use. So when you do your research, don't just say, this was a blended class. Because a blended class means about a thousand different things, right? Blended learning is this kind of umbrella term. And what you really need to do is identify the core attributes that make up your blends. What are the core, what are the things? What are the what's the essence of the pedagogy in your blend? And articulate why you think that those core attributes would have an impact on whatever the outcome is that you care about. And too many studies don't do that. Um, this one's similar. Many blended models focus on surface features. So we're describing the models in terms of the physical environment, the online and the face-to-face, -face, when really we should be describing the models in terms of the pedagogical features. So, go. Oh. So we're going to do a little, really quick activity here to help you understand this. I want you to with a partner that's close to you, identify one or two things that you want. Imagine you're purchasing a car, a new car, or an old car, if you're like me. Um, one or two things you want your vehicle to be able to do. Quick, I'm just gonna give you 30 seconds. So connect one or two things you want your vehicle to be able to do. Okay, and then identify two or three core attributes that would lead to those outcomes, to your car being able to do that. So what, wait, first, what, what were some of the things you wanted your vehicle to be able to do? What? Self-driving, Self okay. So it's gonna have to have some AI in it. That's gonna be a core attribute. <laughs> Right? Okay. For the core attributes, I think it should be quality assured at, at, at each stage, tested before being rolled out to me. Right. So I'm assured of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, like, I, like, you might want your vehicle to be able to tow something, or you might want it to be able to drive a certain speed, right? Or have a certain power. I mean, there are a lot of kind of core attributes, and there are there are a lot of outcomes that we might want, and um, there are things about the car that might lead to those. And certainly, so here's some examples: your outcomes might you you might want a certain number of miles per gallon or horsepower, or be able to carry a certain number of people. Surface features include things like the 
color, the number of wheels, the number of doors, you know, kind of the physical things. But really what we want is to look what's under the hood. So this is a metaphor that I'm trying to help you understand with blended learning. So all of these vehicles here are red. In a lot of the blended learning research, people are saying, they're, they're talking about the color of the car. We don't want the color. We want that this thing, you know, gets 30 miles to the gallon. We want to look what's under the engine, what's under the hood. So that's the point of this. So core attributes, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, challenge number three is what I just shared with you. Blended learning is a treatment effect. Blended learning is the umbrella term and it's really the pedagogy that is the treatment effect, not the not that it's blended. Not so specific in how you describe your research. It's not generalizable. It's not replicable. So uh, the more the detail, and that too on the concept side of it, or the pedagogical or philosophical side of it. That's what's important yeah. to understand that research and the outcomes. Because right. if that has changed, the picture might be different. Yeah. And I, I feel like, you know, I mean, I've done qualitative descriptive research too. And it's not helpful, I think, in most cases to just describe everything in great detail. Because then you don't know what was Hassan thinking? I mean, what did he build into this course that he felt was going to lead to the outcomes that he wants? And that's where this idea of core attributes comes in. There may be lots of things about the course. You don't need to describe all of those things in minute detail, but you do need to be very clear about what you think the core attributes are that are going to impact the outcomes. And you may discover in your iterations that you left a core attribute out that you need to add in later on. But it's that reflection, it's that being very clear about what those elements are that you think are contributing to the outcomes that's important. And I think I have a fourth one, which is the last one. Oh, this is the slide that I showed you that shows all of the different <coughs> These are also the ways that we're measured in. So the outcomes in that meta-analysis, all kinds of different outcomes. So it, may, it just makes it really hard, you know, it's, they, they weren't all even learning, right? Uh, And then here's the fourth one, and this one, uh, this one is particularly a challenge for people who are doing the scholarship of teaching and learning and doing case studies. Case studies can be really, really valuable because they share uh, tacit things that are happening in your course, designs, best practices, things that have worked for you in your context with other people, but uh, oftentimes people tell the local story but don't try and show what the implications are for a more general audience. And that's, I think that that's important. Don't just, don't just tell the case, try and show how the case relates to the, the larger context. Those are the, I think maybe we should end here because uh, there are some additional things that you can look at, at after this. Oh, I put some, I put some uh, research studies that I did, kind of my path 
through the research that you can look at and see some interesting different studies, but I don't think we have time to go into that right now. So thank you for lasting it out the whole two hours.